Our next speaker will be sharing a challenge that she worked on, which definitely does not sound like a walk in the park. Um, she created a playbook for scaling user research teams, uh, user research across a recently transformed agile enterprise organization, including over 400 Scrum teams, 400. Um, if you wondered how to listen, diagnose, and put in place key initiatives uh, to navigate and deliver value amidst a uh, tremendous change, uh, this talk is for you. So Jim has spent over the last 20 years helping organizations optimize human-centered design to gain business advantage and build customer value. She currently is the VP of UX Research and Insights at Fidelity Investments. She previous, previously held leadership roles at Athena Health and Nielsen Norman. So let's have a big round of applause for Jen Cardello. there. Welcome, Jim. All these happy people, <laughs> happy faces. Um, thank you so much for the great introduction. And this is an amazing event, very well designed, <laughs> I have to say, from a speaker's perspective. Um, and I hope everyone's enjoying the morning so far. That was a great talk by Jared. So I'm going to start by talking. I'm going to ask you a few questions first, um, just to set the stage for what we're going through at Fidelity. Um, and what my team has been working on. So first thing is, um, do you find yourself playing the role oh, <laughs> of a change agent in a changing, in a transforming organization? Um, so this is a big position that we get put in as designers, as researchers, um, is helping shepherd along change in the way that we work and where we focus. So if that's something that you're finding yourself in, this may be useful to you. Um, are you also working within a complex product landscape? So in our world, we have offerings and services and features and workflows. Um, we have lots of different types of services and features that we offer to all different types of customers. And it's become very complex over the years that we've been in business, which has been a very long time. And do you find your organization possessing an insatiable appetite for user insights? Um, this is a luxurious position to be in. A lot of my research colleagues at other organizations are spending a lot of time begging the organization to listen to the voice of the user. That's not the case at Fidelity. Um, we are in an enviable position, but it's something that we need to figure out how to keep up with. So that's why scale is so very important to us, and it's the thing that we've been working on the past year and a half. So we're going to talk about the playbook that we've put together to get through our specific situation to address the needs of our specific organization. In this playbook, there may be pieces and parts that apply to some of your organizations, but what we're going to talk about is how to make it work um, in your worlds, too. So first, a little bit about me. So I'm the head of user experience, research, and insights at Fidelity. I look out over four business units, and I have a team of about 32 people right now, and still growing, um, who are spread across those four business units. And a little bit about my background, for those who don't know me, I'm trained as an architect. Uh, so back in the 90s, I went to school for architecture. And in the mid-90s, um, someone showed me Mosaic, and I got really excited and ended up being an information architect. Um, so I worked at a small consultancy, and then I went on to a company called Gomez, which was creating scorecards and um, scoring ease of use across brokerage firms and then spanned out to more financial services. There I led the research team, the design team, and I also launched a user experience auditing service. And then I, um, I got sold a couple times, went through some uh, transactions, and I went out on my own for about a year and a half. After that point, I joined Nielsen Norman Group, where I toured the world, um, teaching courses on information architecture, navigation design, persuasion, and analytics. And then in 2014, I joined the team at Athena Health because of some things that I heard when I was touring with Nielsen Norman Group. Um, I was hearing lots of designers ask very curious questions that I felt that maybe I had become out of touch with. And what it was referring to was agile transformations, changes in the way these businesses were working that I felt were very, very important 
for me to understand in order to give advice to people who came to those courses. Um, and so I was very interested in diving in and figuring out how it works. And at Athena, I led the research team, and I also ended up founding their design platforms and ops um, group. And then in 2018, I went to Fidelity. So taking the things I learned at Athena, who was also going through an agile transformation, and helping 230 scrum teams actually take advantage and build capability in design and research, brought that over to Fidelity as they were starting embarking on their agile transformation that was rolling through four of their business units. So Fidelity is a 73-year-old company. Um, we have a rich legacy and heritage in asset management. We help, uh, here's a fun fact, one out of every four Americans has a relationship with Fidelity. Um, I know we have presence in Europe and Canada as well. And our mission now is to help people with their financial well-being, which is a bigger mission than we've been on in the past when we've thought mostly about brokerage. Um, so this is a, a big deal, and we're changing the way we think about who we serve and how we serve them, and we needed to change the way we work as well. So that's where the Agile transformation came into play. So I like to remind people what Agile means to us, um, because it's not just about a framework. Um, people will often say, what are you guys using? Are you using SAFE? Are you using Scrum, Kanban, whatever? Um, that's really not so much what this was about, and it's one of the reasons that I went to this company. Because the conversation that I had was with executive leadership. This wasn't an agile transformation that was led out of engineering. Engineering had already been moving that way over the past decade. But when I talked to executives about agile and what that meant to them, it was really heartening to hear uh, what, what that meant. So agile with a small a to them meant First of all, we have to get really good at learning fast. So let's figure out how to accelerate our learning velocity. The second thing was amplifying innovation. So if we can accelerate how fast we can learn, we can amplify how quickly we can innovate. And the reason that we would innovate quickly is so that we can drive value for our customers. So we can give them more and get them closer to that place of financial well-being, feeling confident about their future about things like retirement, or putting kids through college, all of those things that keep us up at night. How do we do a better job of that? So our product organization is very large. I'm not allowed to tell you the exact numbers, but I'm going to show you dots. So, um, and use words like several. Um, we have several business units um, that my group is, is helping. Personal investing, workplace investing, um, so any of you who have 401ks, 403bs, you're familiar with those types of investment vehicles, um, we provide that. We also have Fidelity Institutional, which is a platform for non-Fidelity advisors to sit on who have their own clients. And then we also have healthcare that we've moved into with HSAs and other types of healthcare uh, financial vehicles. We also have many domains that are nested within these business units. And that produces hundreds of product teams that we are supporting, and we call those squads. And what this results in for us is a pretty amazing ratio. <laughs> so um, to a user researcher, this is a little overwhelming. So for every UX researcher, we have 15 squads we would kind of be trying to, uh, to provide research services for. It doesn't always end up being 1 to 15 because it's, it's not, in reality, there's a lot of squads that are working on functionality that may be back-end or not have user-facing functionality. But this is the reality of the big number. Another number that you may have seen recently is that we are, have a ratio of one researcher for every eight designers. And so we're trying to figure out how, how do we actually help this organization be user-centered and make good on their customer obsession when there's so few of us and so many of them and so many teams that are trying to create great experiences. So it's a nice challenge to have, um, and this is what we've been doing. So I arrived at this company six months into the first wave of Agile transformation. This was in June of 2018. Our first business unit, personal investing, was digging in hard and learning how to be Agile. 
Um, so they were the, the first guinea pigs to go through this process. And so I showed up in the summer and had to figure out quickly what to do. And so this was what my first 90 days looked like. I listened a lot. <laughs> Um, so at least for the first month, if not more, I was on what I called my listening tour. So who am I talking to? I'm talking to designers, researchers of course, but I'm also talking to squad leads, product managers, domain leads, tribe leads, engineering folks, people throughout the organization, people in the innovation lab, um, people in our data organization where UX research lives, to really understand what are the unmet needs here. This organization, the research organization, had been in place for over 20 years at Fidelity. And they had been doing amazing work. Um, but the organization was changing, so how did we need to change to, to respond to that? So I listened, I articulated their needs, so I was able to synthesize, I wrote a plan, I socialized the plan a lot because I needed partners to buy in to where we were going to go with this team and what we were going to deliver. And then I iterated it, and then we started executing. So when I talk about a plan, I like to be explicit with people about what I mean. So I write a memo. Um, I think this is an important piece. It's a little detail, but um, I like to provide a good assessment and plan to an organization so they understand what I am hearing, what I am seeing, and how I would think about going about approaching this. Because I want to understand, I want us to all be on the same page. If we're not singing off the same sheet of music, then we're not going to get the support that we need. So I start with an assessment of the operating model. How is the team currently getting work? How are they doing work? How are they delivering work? Who are they working with? I did a portfolio analysis. So what is the work that we're doing? What are we focusing on? What questions are we answering? A gap analysis of the product organization's needs versus the current model. So how are we working versus what the organization is moving toward and needs? And then a summary of strategy. So a strategic intent, a vision and mission, OKRs, and some proposed key initiatives that we can go after in the next year, and an org structure and span and coverage. And then, very importantly, number five, asks. You're asking the organization to give you things so that you can make this a reality, whether that's headcount, or that's support from HR and talent acquisition, or that's support from other organizations and other executives. You need to be very explicit about what you need to make this happen, because it's not magic. Um, it's not fairy dust that just appears. Um, and then a future outlook. So what will happen if we can change the way we work? What do we actually get from that? How does that benefit all of us? You think about the maturity model, that's something you could show them. If we can get to this place, if we behave this way, what will we see in return from business outcomes, from engagement outcomes, for our users' outcomes? So this is what I heard when I was touring. We always talk about these three things. Research studies, usability, and building fast. How fast can we ship stuff? How fast can we get things out the door? But based on the people I was talking to, I was hearing a very different story around what was important. So more critical than research studies was a connection to customers. So get the teams close to the customers. They're the ones doing the work. Let's make sure they have those relationships. This is good for building empathy. That's what the teams wanted, not more research studies and not faster research studies. Let's focus on usefulness first before usability. Let's make sure that the things that we're putting out there are things that people need, that they actually solve problems that people have surfaced to us, and we're actually thinking very critically about how best to serve those problems. And then. We're not just focused on pumping stuff out and putting it in the market. We need to learn fast to create better things that serve the needs of our customers. So these were the more critical aspects, and I was enthusiastic after hearing that. Um, very exciting first 90 days to learn that you're in an organization that can see a brighter future for itself and understand how design and research plays into that. 
So the question for us was, how might we pivot UX research to meet these needs and these things the organization is saying is so important to them? So one thing is about basically thinking about where, where we come from, how we position what we do. So we focus a lot on what we do versus why we do it. And so what we were saying all the time was, you know, we conduct research studies. That's what we do. It's what we create. This is our currency. Um, you know, it's kind of like talking to a designer who says, well, I create wireframes. The moment you think someone's taking that away from you, like a product owner goes and talks to a customer or creates a wireframe, it causes friction. So maybe we ne need to not think about the output, but more about the impact. So I wanted to focus on the impact that this team could have in the future. So these are the things that we wanted to get done. We wanted to help the organization accelerate its learning velocity. Help them learn really fast from users about what's really, really important to them. Help them put things out in the water and see how those resonate. Get them into a place where they're able to do rapid ideation and, and creating lots and lots of concepts. Connect the product teams to customers so that they have empathy, they can hear directly from those they are building things for. And then, yep. <laughs> and sharing useful and usable experiences. So we're not getting rid of usability, but we're saying usefulness is first. We have to make sure that these concepts that are being generated are actually things that people will use, they will adopt, and this will provide value to them, and therefore value to us. So here's the playbook that we used. Um, it's a sliver of the work that we're doing, um, but I hope this is helpful to you, and I look forward to talking pe to people as the day goes on. So first of all, we had to design our org. What does it look like? What's the shape of it? Um, how do we approach that? How do we reflect the organization we're, that we're in? How do we come to where the organization is? The next thing we did was establish a framework for thinking about the work that we do. We share this framework with the design organization because we're partners with them, um, but it's a good way to talk about the work so that we have a shared vocabulary. And then the next thing we did was focus on building capability in the organization. Um, because we weren't going to grow our team exponentially larger, we needed to figure out how to give the organization the things that we know, how to create that infused mentality of user-centeredness. So designing the org, how might we design and position the team to deliver the most impact that it can? So I created these three A's of org design to think about how we approach this. Ap altitude is the first, so where do we fly? How high do we fly in the organization? Um, that's helping us figure out what type of impact we can have. The next is aperture. So how big are the projects that we take on? How many squads do they impact? And then the next is arrangement. So how do we arrange the people and the skills and the T-shapes so that they're complementary? So altitude. In our organization, we have nomenclature that we have adopted that's maybe familiar to some. Um, in each business unit, we have domains. Domains have tribes. Tribes have product squads. So the squad is the product team, is what I consider to be the product team. They group into these tribes, domains, and business units. And so if you're thinking at, at a business unit level or domain level, they're really thinking about the 30,000 foot view, those really big customer journeys, those things that, that really create the essence of the experience um, and, and really crafting or describing how we want that experience to feel and what outcomes we expect from that. All the way down to the street view, where we're thinking about the, the nitty gritty details of the pieces, the tasks that make up those journeys. And all of this work is important, but when you only have 30 designer, or 30 researchers, you need to think about where you're going to play. So from an altitude perspective, we fly here at the domain and tribe level. We have another construct we use as well, which is neighborhoods. 
um, which I haven't included here because it adds a little bit more confusion, but sometimes we also work at the neighborhood level, which is a, a unit of, of squads and tribes that moves across business units, so sometimes we help there as well. Aperture is the next area for us, so thinking about how big are the projects that we work on. In agile speak, um, if we talk in terms of uh, Scrum and Jira, we think about initiatives, sub-initiatives, epics, and user stories. And for focus for us, we want to actually be at that initiative and sub-initiative level. That's how we can feed the most squads with the most value. From an arrangement perspective, we think first of our team com composition. So our team is made up of people who study psychology, human factors, sociology, design strategy, engineering, just to name a few of the things that are more populous in our, in our group. Um, but it's a very diverse group of many T-shapes. And we can get advantage from that by combining those T-shapes together into complementary groupings. But we weren't working that way. We were operating as free agents. So we were sending people out into the world, out into the product org, and saying, okay, do the best you can at helping these 15 squads do some work, some meaningful work. So go talk to all of them and figure out what they need and then try to fit it into your schedule. And as you can imagine, that's a really tough way to live in an organization. Uh, first of all, you're alone. Um, and second of all, you're never going to be able to satisfy the needs of 15 scrum teams. Um, and we call this peanut buttering. Um, it's a verb about just taking people and trying to spread them across the organization to get as much coverage as you can. And peanut buttering is not a great way to derive value and impact. So we created a construct that lives within the organization. And they're called pods. So we have a research director and three researchers who actually live together. Um, and they, they fly at that domain and tribe level. And this way, they have enough vision and, um, and they have view into what that organization is doing, what their big, big uh, goals are, what their initiatives are, and they can prioritize that and work with them in a way that's more strategic. This is what our organization ultimately looks like. So we have a UX research organization that has research ops and four business units that we're serving with groupings of pods of researchers. Very, very importantly, we live in a different organization. We don't live with design. Um, and I think this is a really important point because it's been an experiment for us, but we're learning so very much about this. So we live within a larger research and insights organization, uh, which includes, you know, there's analytics and there's AI in that organization. There's lots of measurement teams. But my peers, my partner groups are strategic market research, behavioral economics, brand and advertising research, and customer loyalty, which gives us a whole bunch of flexibility and ways we can approach projects as a team um, with many different techniques that we can use. Um, so this has proven to be a very nice partnership and a nice complement to UX research. The next thing is not an A, it's an E, uh, so I didn't include it in the three A's, but it's our engagement model. So how do you teach the organization to interact with you? Um, and this sometimes has to be retraining of sorts. So how might we make it easy for teams to understand what we offer and involve us when we can add the most value? The when is a really important piece. If they're only calling you up when they have something right before they're going to ship and they just need a check mark on their definition of done, you've got a problem. Um, we don't want to be brought in just to do usability testing. There's nothing more frustrating than doing that and surfacing during a usability test usefulness problems. <laughs> because at that point, a product owner doesn't want to hear it. Um, they are just thinking about their deadline and shipping this thing. So those are just setting up tensions that we'd like to not have. We want to have those usefulness conversations when they should be had. Um, and so when I talk about the framework, you'll see where we pinpoint that we want to have those conversations. But so 
The basic story here was this year and last year, we've been almost 100% reactive. So people will show up and say, I need a usability study. And then we have to have a consulting conversation about that. Like, what is it that you need a usability study for? Where are you in the design process? Let's talk about these things. In 2020, we're setting ourselves up for a better situation with more of our work being generated proactively. So an 80-20 mix, leaving 20% for reactive situations where we don't know what we don't know. How do we do that? How do we actually behave in a proactive manner? So one of the things we've started doing is quarterly cross-tribe discussions. So we host these two-hour workshops. Um, we often are doing these over, um, over Zoom and with a mural board pulled up. And we're having our tribe leads talk about all of their mission-critical initiatives. And we're saying, what would be nice to hear from you guys is a problem statement about that initiative and your hypo any hypotheses that you have. And let's talk this through so that we can get at where your highest areas of uncertainty and risk are, what's keeping you up at night about this thing, so that we can put in place some strategic research to help you. And sometimes that research is led by UXR, and sometimes we do that in partnership with market research or behavioral economics teams or measurement teams. Um, so we're finding the best way to serve those critical needs. So that conversation is super important. This is what our directors in UX research are responsible for. It's one of the most important things that they can do. So they're also figuring out the important versus the urgent, right? We're trying to work on more things that are important and less things that are just urgent, worrisome things. And then as part of that discussion, we fill out the mural board with them. We're getting all those thoughts down. We go back. We think about it. We figure out what projects we could do for them, what, what type of research we could do for them. And we create something called an insights agenda. We come back with that and say, what do you think about this for the next three to six months? How would this feel if we, did, if we were able to accomplish, accomplish these things to feed all of your squads and this, this tribe or domain that you're running? And so then they sign off on that, or we have another conversation. And then we know what we're going to be working on. And one of the reasons that I'm very adamant about doing this is there's a misunderstanding about Agile. So when you're essentially a shared service, there's this feeling that you're supposed to do research on demand and instantaneously. And that's just not possible. And a lot of times, that's not good research. And that's not really delivering the most impact and value that we can to the organization. So we're switching that up to be more proactive and surface the areas where we can help the most. For reactive work, we host office hours across each of our domains to make sure that we are available to answer questions and to help guide people's inquiries as they're going out and trying to learn. So what's an insights agenda? This is a deliberately blurry picture, uh, so forgive me. But it's prioritizing initiatives across a domain, identifying critical research and insights needs, and mapping out research for the next quarter. These color codes that we use, we have five different project types that we like to talk about. So we have net new product. So we're introducing a new product into the market. We have net new capability. So we have a product, but we want to add some features, workflows, something to it. We have UX debt, tech debt, and optimization. That's how we categorize the work that designers do, that squads are doing. And so that's what that color coding is about. And then what we do is talk about, within a time frame, when will we be taking on this work and who would be doing that? Who would be partnering on this? Is this market research in UXR? Is it, human, is it the behavioral economics team in UXR? So we're basically saying, if we were able to get through all of these things for all of these initiatives, would this help you guys? Would this give you enough fuel to give you the learnings you need to amplify your innovation? So that's designing the org. Altitude, aperture, arrangement, and the engagement model. The next piece is establishing a framework. So how might we help product teams and researchers talk about discovery and design to identify when and how research can help? 
This is interesting because when you start talking about these types of things at a conference like this, people are like, I know what UX is. I know what UX research is. Um, but that's not always the case in every organization. So we start by defining what we mean. <laughs> so why are we doing UX research? We're doing it to mitigate risk and to ensure that we create relevant and useful products that deliver effective, efficient, and delightful experiences. So we're thinking about usefulness, we're thinking about usability, we're making sure that we're delivering value. And we start with the basic building blocks. We've all seen this. Build the right thing, build the thing right, and then we built our framework around that. So this is a very simple, logical construct that seems to have resonated well within our organization beyond design and research. Because it's, it's really just three things to remember. And we all take this for granted, but it means a lot to, to a large organization to be able to have this shared vocabulary. Right problem, right solution, done right. Do we know what the problem is that we're actually going after? I can't help you with research if we don't know what the problem is. And if you don't know what the problem is, I can help you do research to surface that. And that's okay. We want to help you there. If we know what the problem is, if we know that there's unmet needs that we can go after, either with existing experiences or things we just simply don't even offer yet, then we know how to measure whether these are good solutions. And we can mitigate risk around usefulness and whether it's feasible technically and whether it's also something that the business sees as viable. And then once we've done that, we know that users want it, we know the business feels good about it, we know our engineers can build it, then we can start getting into all the details that would, uh, would lead to doing usability testing and then looking at things in market and continuously improving them. So it's just a logical progression that we take people through to help them move through product discovery and design. Um, and this has been one of the better ways we've found to have those conversations when someone comes walking up and says, I need a card sort. I need a tree test. I need a usability test. Um, okay, where are you? Let's talk about this. The, let's talk about it in looking at this. So that's been very helpful. What we've done is we've aligned qualitative and quantitative methods in here as well. I'm casting shadows. So, um, so we have a series of qualitative and quantitative things, methods that we apply pre-market and in-market to think about each of these phases. So in Right Problem, we're doing qualitative work in one-on-one -on -one interviews, user observation, ethnography approaches. In quantitative, we've started working with jobs to be done. And one of the reasons that we do that is that we do believe there's some goodness there, um, but also the organization, it has been like taking off like wildfire through the organization. So we want to understand that methodology really well. When we're in market, we do UX auditing. We do task flow assessments, user perception surveys. We triangulate with user behavior and other data that we can get. With a right problem, with a strong, great problem to go solve, teams are on a good path to divergent thinking. So this gives them fuel to ideate many ways in which they could solve for the problem. And so once they're in that area, we can get them going with concept feedback or resonance testing qualitatively, and then we can do quantitative testing for concept validation. And then once we've moved through there, we can move into more of the qualitative and quantitative usability testing and auditing again. So this is just a very simple way of thinking about moving through the process. We also have an article on our Medium channel that we just launched on Friday, so you can read more about this framework. So that's the framework. Next was building capability. My colleagues were talking about this uh, a couple weeks ago at the Design Ops Summit, so I'm not going to repeat all of what they said because I never could in the few minutes that I have left. Um, but also on our Medium channel, there is an article about this effort. Um, and there will be more details forthcoming. So building capability, how might we accelerate product team's learning velocity and shift the altitude of our UX research? So there were a couple things we were focusing on here, uh, on this, this effort here. So first of all, our average intake to delivery amount of time was 14 days. So someone would put in a request for a study and it would take about two and a half sprints to get that delivered. So teams are waiting a long time to learn. 
The second thing is, when I did my assessment of our portfolio in 2018, what I realized was that 85% of our work was in the done right category. So we just looked at that framework. That meant that most of our work was evaluative. Most of it was usability studies. And most of it was at the end of the design and discovery process. That's not where we get impact. So in 2019, we set a target. The target was that we would shift the amount of done right work down to 60% from 85. We would increase right solution from 10 to 25%. And we would take our big right problem work from 5 to 15%. And we would effectively be moving our work from where we were at the squad level up to here, where we needed to be in a more strategic positioning. And so we took the framework and we looked at it carefully. And we said, what can we do about this? How can we get this, this calculation to work? And this is where we focused. We said, this is interesting. 85% of our work sits in done right. It's qualitative usability and task flow assessment. And it's typically done during the rapid iterative prototyping process. What if we shared that responsibility with some other folks? So we launched a, an initiative called the Democratization of Research. So we're training up product team members to create remote, un, unmoderated um, studies. So we just focused on one thing we could democratize, not all of it. And this is very important because we needed guardrails on this to ensure that we had validity and that the research insights that were being generated were valid and strong, uh, that we felt good about those. That's what people worry about with democratization, is that you're giving away the keys to the kingdom, and there's going to be a whole bunch of bad research conducted. So how can we control for that? So we created a two-pronged program. Education was the first piece. Eight hours of classwork over a two-week period, six students. So it's very, very intimate. Uh, we have a researcher leading it with a TA, another researcher that's playing the teaching assistant. Um, and there's about eight hours of homework that comes with this as well. So it's a 16-hour commitment um, from our product team members. And then once people have gone through that course, learned how to write great tasks, learned all about bias, um, we actually certify them. We know this. Uh, they, they're, they're actually rewarded with a sticker. Very important piece of the program. Um, so they get a sticker for their MacBook. And then they're put on our platform for um, creating remote, unmoderated usability tests. And they get one-on-one -on -one guidance from a user researcher from then on out. They have a buddy. Very big piece of this was ensuring validity. So the research team was kind of like, I don't know how I feel about democratization unless we know that we can check on this work that's being done. And so you get a research buddy. You get presentation feedback on your debriefs. And we actually collect all of your debriefs in our repository. So we are doing auditing on an ongoing basis. In less than a year, 125 designers have been trained and certified. They all have stickers. Um, and they all have tons of knowledge. Um, 215 studies were launched. And we took this 14 days down to three. So teams have accelerated their learning velocity. And they're taking ownership of that. And as far as our target for our team, we've been able to beat all of those numbers. So we're at 56% of our work being strategic, 44% evaluative. Um, and there's an article, as I mentioned, on this on our Medium channel. And the other added bonus of this is it frees us up to learn new techniques. So I told you, jobs to be done, moving through the company like wildfire. How do we take advantage of that? Let's learn it. Let's learn it intimately. So we had Stratagen come in and train us so that we know how to use that methodology. And we can hack it, too. So we can use it in a way that we believe in. So we've designed the org. We've established a framework. We've built capability. What are the watchouts? Don't assume any of these plays will work in your company. Um, you, you need the right situation, the right ingredients. This is a company that was in that place where they were ready for this change, and they needed help going through the transformation. So we kind of jump on the coattails of that and ride along. Um, and so that's why it works here. Some of these things may work for you, too. So make sure you conduct a listening tour. Write a formal assessment and plan. Write that memo. 
Make sure that people read it and give you feedback. So that's the next piece. Don't start executing without getting feedback. Partners, stakeholders, um, design your research leaders, people on your team, have them read that plan. You want reactions. You want honest, candid reactions so that you know how to pivot this and iterate it. Don't set it and forget it. Just like product design, there's continuous improvement here. That democratization program didn't just like manifest and start running. We piloted it for two months um, before we got it into the place where it could run a little bit smoother and it's still being improved. Don't be quiet. That's the worst thing that we can be. If we're not talking about this throughout the organization, people won't understand the value that we can add. So I've been on a road show since January, <laughs> putting this plan in front of everyone, making sure they understand the research framework, talking to every squad lead, every guild meeting, everywhere that I can go and my team can go, we actually have a running tracker of all the roadshow presentations that we do. We've done about 45 this year. It's important, you can't be quiet. And don't underestimate the resistance to change. It is strong and powerful. Um, your team needs to be resilient. The only thing that we can count on is that things will change. They're always going to change. Your structure might change. Your domains may change. The products you sell may change. Let's find a way to let that change be maneuverable, that we can work with it. And so that resilience is important. It's something you should think about when you're hiring talent as well. Uh, you're looking for people who can face up to that and be adaptable. The other thing is creating a climate for change because as a change agent, you need to be in an environment where you can do the special work that you need to do. One of the things I like to recommend to people is Cotter's eight-step process for leading change. I think this is really, um, it's one of those things I've used for initiatives over the past three years. Whenever things are going haywire, I always remember, oh, I didn't use Cotter's rules. Um, I skipped a step. So, Create a sense of urgency. What is going on in your company that would make design so very important for them right now? How could it be used as a strategic lever to get them what they need to get to survive, to sell more product, to make customers happier? Um, so find those big boulders in your organization and ride the coattails of that. That sense of urgency is important. Build a guiding coalition. Take your assessment and plan and shop it around and find the people who will join that coalition with you. Form a strategic vision and initiatives. Make it clear how the work that you're doing could feed this company and help it be successful. Enlist a volunteer army. Enable action by removing barriers. Generate short-term wins. Sustain acceleration and institute change. These are things you constantly have to think about. Change doesn't happen overnight. It's hard. It's really hard work. So the key takeaways. Listen. Open your ears and listen to the organization. Be really honest and ask them to be very candid with you. Focus on impact, not output. We don't want to create 300 usability studies this year. We want better decisions being made by the organization. How can we do that for you and with you? Create a shared vocabulary so that we can start infusing design language, research language into the org. Build capability, share your responsibilities, teach people how to do things. And then be kind to yourself, because change is really hard. You need to be patient. Um, it can be very frustrating, but you'll find your way through it if you have a plan. So thank you all very much. Thanks. Do you want to be here? We can take one question. Okay. Okay, uh, so we are running a little behind, so we'll take one question. That was extremely resourceful and inspirational. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so one question, one really interesting question we got was, when you're implementing the playbook or the plan, at what phase did you face the most resistance internally from the squads and the tribes? Oh, it cycles <laughs> back. It's like, you know, sometimes you think you've um, vaccinated properly, but you haven't. Um, I think in the beginning, 
um, we, had a, we had an off-site, an on-site off-site in September of 2018, and we were talking about our hopes and fears, and the fears of the research team were the biggest right. to get over. Um, right. So there was a sense of rejection of like, no, we can't teach people how to do our jobs, and our jobs will go away. Right. And so showing them that map of, you guys are doing all this work right now at this level that's not very strategic. What if you learned new skills and were able to have impact over here? They started becoming very enamored with that idea right. of being more valuable and doing really super valuable work and being strategic. And they also started to understand that sharing that capability wasn't going to put them out of a job. Right. Um, and right. so that, that was the biggest hurdle for us to get over because if the team isn't selling it, Right. I can't sell it by myself. I can go on right. as many road shows as I want, but right. if I have 30 people behind me and are like, uh-uh, then it's, it's not going to happen. So that's the biggest piece. Get the team to buy into the plan. Thank you so much. Thank you that very really much. Thank you. Thanks.